So, Shaman Center, go to the to the bank. I don't remember what bank, but it was a. Uh, he went to the temple, the uh, president of the bank, his office, and wanted to make a donation. He said, "Well, we can't do it that way. We have to do a follow the program. That we got a whole system we have to implement." But he dumped all the money on the guy's table, on his desk. He said, "Okay, okay, we'll take your donation, your 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 deposit." Then. He asked the guy, is there anything going to happen in the near future that might raise the stock market? So we, my spiritual master wants to make an investment. He wants to know if you got any inside, like inside trading. And so he says, well, the Japanese, the Japan government is going to soon buy a lot of gold. So the price of gold is going to shoot up very soon. Okay, that's all he needed to know. So he goes to Prabhupada and told him the story. So, okay, you call Karandar and tell him to bring... I think it was maybe two hundred thousand dollars. Says, tell him we're going to open up a temple here in Switzerland, and we need that money. So bring it in cash. Anyway, he brought the money. Then he probably told him what it was for, and he said, "Well, you can't do that. You can't. That's that's gambling, Sheila Prabhupada. You can't do that. It's against the rules." And so Prabhupada laughed and said, "Well, Shama Sinder can do it. He's all right. He can do anything. So let him invest it." So they sat there in the, in the hotel watching the stock market go up and down. So finally it started hitting a, a different plateaus going up and up and up and up. So the price of gold was, you know, multiplying. And so they made a huge, they doubled their money in a matter of like a few minutes. And then they leveled out and probably said, okay, sell. So there's a story that nobody knows. That's like just maybe it's confidential, but anyway, now the world knows. Then there's a the seven up story. Prabhupada's in a plane. And so the seven up story gets, it's get, it got a lot of exposure because everybody liked the idea of drinking seven up. So Prabhupada on a plane asked for some drink and would you like seven up, Shiro Prabhupada? So it's just lemon flavored uh, uh, drink that's very common. He took a little sip of it, you know, like he did without touching. And I used to be the one to clean his glass, his drinking glass in L.A. And when I saw him do that, I thought I hadn't really cleaned the glass, but that's how he drank, you know, without touching the, the, the cup. In any case, so he said, oh, very nice, nice drink. Bring me another one. And so he had a few more 7-Ups during the flight. And then different times he asked for 7-Up. One was in New York. They were looking at a, a building that was possibly going to be bought. And so he asked if there's any 7-Up available. So one devotee ran into a store and brought out a can of 7-Up and probably drank from that. Then he gave that can to, to Shama Sundar. He drank from it. And then he passed it around. Everybody had to drink from that can, right out of the can. And so it was like Drobody's pot. doesn't empty. And then there's a story, the Dob story. Now this is by... by uh, uh, Guru Kripa, Maharaj at that time. So they were in uh, Vishakhapatnam waiting to take, the train was there in the station, but there was, it wasn't leaving until much later. And so they uh, were waiting and Shama Sundar again climbed up and got a daub off the tree. And he prepared the daub for Prabhupada. And Prabhupada drank from that daub. If you know Dobbs, sometimes it doesn't come out so good, you know. And uh, so he drank and drank and drank. And then he gave it to Shama Sundar. Oh, he drank from it. Then he gave it, to his, gave it to the Kirtan party. So they all drank from that Dobb. And Guru Kripa said, he says, I'm not going to let anybody else drink from that. I'm going to drink it all. He's drinking, he's drinking, he's drinking. Finally, you know, he thought there's no, going to be no end to this. So, But he was fully satisfied and it was all over himself. And he passed it on, and others drank from the gear. The party was a big party, the Kirtan party. They all were really satisfied by drinking out of that dub. And he passed it on to some rickshaw wall, and he's still probably drinking. But there's Draupadi's pot, another miracle taking place. So miracles 
are understood to be something that we don't understand, can't understand how it's done. But Prabhupada performed miracles, and he asked, what miracles do you perform? And so he's looking at like uh, some different devotees that were sitting there and said, this is my miracle. These devotees who are like, you know, preaching and, and making, they go anywhere in the world, they, they're brave. They have no fear, and they just go anywhere, and ultimately, uh, they just uh, preach and preach, and the movement is blessed by having all these extra extraordinary devotees who have no fear. So, uh, the preaching went on all over the world, and, and he said that ultimately, the biggest preachers are the artists. Uh, when I heard that, I thought, well, I'm really impressed by, the, by that fact that artists, but then he said artists are sudras. I said, oh my God. So now I was thinking first of artists are big people who are top preachers and now we're sudras. So I was, uh, <laughs> I was a little bit set back by that. But in any case, we're not really sudras, but we're, the profession is any kind of handicraft or working with your hands, any trade is sudra labor. But as devotees, we're Vaishnavs in the making. And so whatever we do has an ult ultimately has a stronger effect. And it's not pseudo labor, but it's top preaching. That's exactly what, what I'm doing today to this very moment. I'm still working and painting and making books and, and preaching. So artists, their preaching goes out and reaches a lot of people. So another miracle, Jadarani was really sick in one point in LA. And so she was uh, in a wheelchair. She couldn't even move her hands hardly at that point. She could hardly drink her, her broth or soup that she was taking. She had some doctor who was a, a, from reading the eyes, he could detect where the, the problems were. And so that problem was uh, only uh, in a guy's head really. How much can you look and see in the eyes? They're going to tell you what the what the disease is. In any case, she's wheeled into Prabhupada's room, and she had to crawl across the floor to get to Prabhupada in the bedroom where he was taking a massage. So he looked at her and he said, "What's the problem?" And so then it was explained how sick she is, and she could hardly talk. So finally, Prabhupada just touched her on the head. He said, "You'll be okay, no problem." So. She crawled back out, got in the chair, and was wheeled out and went back downstairs. A few days later, she's drinking and eating and doing everything normally, so she was cured just by Prabhupada's touch. So Prabhupada was a, like a faith healer as well. Now, besides everything else, uh, there's another, another thing about the paintings that Ramachar is presenting some of the paintings to Prabhupada, which he wanted to change from the books that were printed in the 17th volume and so quickly uh, published. So we got better, better view now of, of some of these. Uh, the artists have improved and we can do better pictures now. So we want to improve the pictures and replace them with the same exact picture, only a better rendition of the same subject matter. So Prabhupada, you want to change? What change do you want to do? And so it became very, very serious about that. Every time Ramachar presented another picture, to change even the content and change everything about it, Prabhupada was furious. He's got mad and storming and screaming at him. He said, how do you dare change? I mean, you ruin everything by your changing. Your mentality is like a, if you want to change just to get a better for a better effect you can stand on your hands and and uh, walk on your hands and put your feet up in the air and then you'll be happy in other words change is like a not in the Vaishnava book you don't change the spiritual master's work then he wanted to change Srila Bhakti Sananta's work in a, in one of his books and so I said don't you dare even change a comma no no punctuation if you read Prabhupada's early books that he did here in India, uh, you'll see that they're full of mistakes, but there's so much mercy coming out of those, those books. In fact, intensely 
Prabhupada's mercy is coming pouring straight out by reading those first books. So it may be the the changes are necessary because they were done in a hurry. But careful study is to not to change anything that's, that has to be changed that can't stand as it own on its on its as it is. So anyway, the controversy goes on very intensely in our society. So Prabhupada gave us a, a system that, and it comes from his spiritual master, that when you get money in the morning, you spend it by the afternoon. You don't keep a bank account. And the money that he, he was, he very, uh, he was telling his guest how much money is being made every day, $600,000 a day. And you know, a very impressive amount of money coming in through the sale of books. And so what did Prabhupada do with that money? Half goes into into printing more books and half goes into construction of temples. And so he took nothing from himself. And so, not that he was a hired writer and he was gonna, if he was taking a commission for the work that he was doing, it would have been in thousands of dollars. And so he said the method for, for devotees, a Vaishnava doesn't keep money. And so you don't have a bank account. And brahmacharis with bank accounts is just a rasa basa. And so, unfortunately, that's going on in our society. Money is the, is the God. Money is the honey, but it's not. Money brings nothing but trouble. So if one can, can understand how to survive without the encumberments of material entanglements, then he's, uh, he becomes pure. He's like is un unbelievably situated in the spiritual world. And so the more we get into material and material accumulation, the greater is the responsibility of carrying on and protecting that investment. And uh, like a grihasta has to maintain a family. So Prabhupada says you do it with a little, as little effort as possible and use your intelligence and make money, lazy intelligence. So make money without really half trying. Because any money that comes will come automatically, no matter what. I've gave classes in America about this, and the Kwanas and the different groups, and I talked to a bunch of people all retired. So I was saying that, I said, you know, you don't have to earn the money. The money will come automatically, no matter what you do. And so that money will come uh, in in big volumes sometimes, or come very little at times. So it all depends on the karma, according to our birth. Everything is pre preordained by the time we were conceived. And so by the, by the time we are born, all that comes with us. How much karma we're going to get, how much money we're going to get, when we're going to get it, uh, and the economic value of, of what we have in the way of earning power is all determined, predetermined, before we even take birth, practically. And so why struggle so hard? Why accumulate? Why have a car? I mean, if it's needed in, 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 a, where, in the West, you know, in America, you've got to have a, tar a car. But ultimately, in Mayapur and Vrindavan, why would you have a car? And uh, Prabhupada talked about that in, at great length, that we're, we're like an animal running on four legs and a car has four wheels, so you're not much different. But the economy of of being able to survive and just believing in Krishna is the caliber, it's the barometer of how much our spiritual life has is, is taken hold. That if we believe in one story of a friend of mine, he was a candidate for sannyas back in the early days, and, and ultimately he, he didn't take it, and he came to Vrindavan. He decided to go back to the West and make money. Now this is a, just a repeated story just about everybody. Now you come to my poor Vrindavan and you got to come here with the idea that you're on, on, on grace with Krishna's direct involvement. And so you don't really need to earn money, but you got to have some way to survive. Anyway, he decided to go back to London. So he goes back to London and we're talking about this. I, I said, Prabhu, it's not going to be easy to get back sometimes. I said, are you sure you want to leave? He said, well, I have to go back. He goes back, he gets involved in drugs. And he gets locked up in jail and he hung himself eventually. And so because of the, uh, for different circumstances, his life just fell apart. And so to avoid the whole handicap of, 
trying to spend the rest of your life accumulating money and just avoid it. Now in Mayapur it's understood that you got to have a lot of money to survive here. You got to pay your way or take the highway. And so there has to be a chain within our society that we protect the older and the younger and the women and give an opportunity for people to survive and to to prosper here without the need for like you know paying away so in other words the accumulation of money is not so important